Hello, and welcome to the closing session for the Fall 2020 Data Summit Connect. I'm Mary D. Ojala, Conference Program Director for Information Today, which includes this conference and several other tech-oriented conferences uh, that we do now, of course, all virtually. But there it is. So this session is all about enabling AI for real world results. And we do have two presentations in this session. We will start off with Jaida Putatunda, Senior Data Science with Indelient US. Following Jaida, we will have time for some questions based on her talk. We will then move into our second presentation, which is by Ben Sharma, who is co-founder and chief product officer of Zaloni. So do put any questions that you have for Jaida into the Q&A box so that we can get to those before we move on to Ben's presentation. Um, chat with us in chat. And I'd like to now turn over the program to Jaida. So Jaida, if you want to uh, bring up your slides, that would be great. Great, so uh, should I get started or do you no, have? go ahead. Great, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, very excited uh, that you all are here with me today in my session. Uh, so today's session is about uh, transfer learning. Uh, transfer learning is a very uh, important and up and coming concept in data science and it basically uh, helps us utilize some of the already pre built methods that we have in data science and what problems we can solve in some real world applications. So uh, we look at it uh, from the point of view of uh, how we can achieve and utilize that. So before we start, uh, uh, here's a quick introduction about me. Uh, hi, as uh, Meridi mentioned, my name is Jaita Pudutunda. I'm a senior data scientist uh, with Indelient Inc. Uh, Indelient is a customer driven professional services company. We uh, specialize in tailor-made software and tech solutions. Uh, most of our work is in data analytics and AI-based solutions, but we also have a big chunk of work in business process automation, document management systems, and uh, DevOps. So you can connect with me uh, via Twitter or LinkedIn. These are my uh, Twitter handle and LinkedIn uh, name. My name is pretty unique, so I don't think you'll find another Chaita Bhutatunda in LinkedIn other than my profile. So yeah, uh, send me a connect request or if you have any question uh, after the session, you can reach out to me and uh, we can discuss later. Uh, great. So uh, just a quick overview of today's session. So we'll break it down into a 30 minute uh, uh, talk and a 10 minute Q&A session. And uh, within 30 minute talk, I will go through some of these slides and also show you some uh, hands-on code example via Google Colab Notebook. If you all are interested to like, maybe go through the code later, do let me know and I can upload it to my GitHub account so that you guys can download it and uh, work through it hands-on. Great, so to start off, uh, this is like my favorite image in all over NLP. I would say that NLP is hard. Uh, so NLP is natural language processing. And why I say NLP is hard, it's because sometimes human brains can make connections and references uh, about the English language or a text very quickly. But it seems like a very trivial task for us. But then when you're thinking about a computer program or a computer language and how it's trying to you know, leverage that, that's a daunting challenge for a model to decipher. So here, if you see the image, what does it say? It says that, oh, I'm a huge metal fan. So when you see the picture along with the text, you know that the fan itself is you know, kind of personalizing itself as an electronic device and saying that, oh, I'm a metal fan. But when uh, a, a computer reads this text, it can have multiple meaning, right? That you are a huge metal band fan, like it's a kind of music, right? So there's this problem of ambiguity, synonymity, co-reference, and also syntactic rules that English language has. And that's why uh, the growth uh, of natural language processing and some of the technologies we have right now these days is continuously growing and we are still trying to achieve the highest level of accuracy, accuracy that we can, but it's an ongoing process. 
So for today's agenda, uh, we talk about a little bit about NLP, uh, where it's used, what are some of the very underlying pre-processing steps you should do if you're interested in NLP and want to get started in this field of data science. And uh, then we'll talk about what's transfer learning. We'll talk about how to use BERT and uh, what's some of the overlying concepts of BERT in text classification system. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the Q&A section and I can uh, attend to that uh, at the end of the session. Great, so what is NLP? So NLP is basically uh, a subfield as it's shown in the diagram and the Venn diagram is like a subfield of linguistics, computer science, uh, information engineering, and also artificial intelligence. You see that NLP is also segmented within uh, NLU and NLG, which is nothing but natural language understanding and natural, natural language generation. So it's a two-step, right? First, you have a lot of text. You want to find insights about that. That's natural language understanding. And also, say you have, uh, uh, think of it from a context of generating new uh, language, like say a chatbot, like you're talking to a chatbot how will it create the perfect answer for you? That's a natural language generation based on the historical data collected, model trained, et cetera. So it basically helps machines to understand and communicate with humans uh, back and forth in the free flowing human speech is how it's defined. So if you have been, uh, sorry, I went ahead. So if you've been following the growth of NLP, uh, it has been a huge, tremendous growth over uh, the couple of last, I would say two to three years. If you see some of these diagrams, it shows that how fast the parameters or the size of the models that the company, big companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, OpenAI, NVIDIA are working like increased exponentially. Uh, just in May 2020, uh, OpenAI released a a natural language model with 175 billion parameters like that's a huge number and that means that we are able to you know comprehend so much of natural language text right now and using that to like solve multi-faceted problems in everyday business use cases so we'll see where so that comes where so where is nlp used one of the most basic use cases is definite and very important i would say as well is machine translation so think about it from the perspective of if you want to translate text to different language text, audio to text, uh, and the major feature I'm sure most of us uh, use quite a lot is Google Translate. So if we want to learn a new language or communicate with someone uh, from a different language, we utilize this machine. And it the accuracy that these kind of challenges needs to gain is very high and the margin of error is very less. So the more bigger models and more accurate models we can, we can generate is better for the business use case scenarios. The second one is like chatbots. Like think of it as like you have a lot of chatbot data. Uh, how do you utilize those texts for use cases like say intent classification? Like how do you know that what the user or which product the user is talking about? Can you uh, directly direct them to the uh, you know use cases or the human QAs uh, rather than uh, understanding or constantly asking the user, okay, select this, select that. So that feasible or seamless experience is what uh, natural language helps gaining through, uh, say, question answering uh, and helping in building those knowledge trees. The another section is, yeah, like I mentioned, natural text generation. So let's say you have like huge amount of legal uh, document set, like thousands of pages of documents. Uh, is it possible? It, it is possible, but it is very time consuming for you know human uh, representatives to go through that whole uh, document. So can we do something like you know abstractive summary, creating uh, like text verbs for or add blobs for each of those big documents, and how easily that can be understood by anyone who's just reading versus reading a thousand page uh, document. There's also things like text completion. I'm sure all of you use Gmail and have noticed that when you start writing a line in an email, uh, it kind of prompts you to say that, okay, that this could be a next good sentence or next good word in your sentence. So that's like uh, natural text generation and text completion. 
Uh, another aspect of it is topic modeling. Uh, I, I'm sure all of you, if you are, if you ha have some kind of exposure to how you know various marketing and ad tech firms work. So in order to understand their users, they need to understand what kinds of topics or what kind of news they are reading or what kind of news they're consuming, basically, to understand what's the maybe say top ten trends that's happening in a particular market about a particular product. So in order to do that, we need to process a lot of social data, uh, published blogs, uh, Reddit threads, Twitter tweets. So from there, we can extract a lot of uh, information and do topic clustering and topic modeling, uh, basically to understand uh, various kinds of uh, sentiments. And from sentiments that comes the next is the text classification, which is a big chunk in NLP. So here, you, if you want to understand what's the sentiment, uh, if a user is giving a review, if it's a positive, negative, and it's not only enough to talk about positive negative, but also like how much positive, like or what are the exact words that cater to that positive sentiment and what I can do better uh, to kind of, you know, elevate the customer's user experience. So all those are very prevalent business use cases of uh, NLP and uh, has been applied in almost every industry uh, that I have seen and I have uh, worked on. So uh, I understand that uh, this was a very overall general idea, but I wanted to also walk through a little bit of uh, technical hands-on know-how on how we basically handle some of these text data so that after this session, you should have a basic understanding that if you're interested in NLP and want to explore, you know exactly how to you know, structure your learning or structure your processes from here. So the first step in like cleaning any or working with any text data is to kind of clean it. Um, as they say that uh, if you garbage in and garbage out, that's the exact concept of NLP. Like you have to have data that's clean, that's uh, noiseless. So this first step is of noise cleaning and removing all kinds of extra spaces. So in this quick, um, text script, you can see that if there's a whole text uh, with a lot of extra spaces trailing as well as in the middle of the uh, sentences, in the middle of the words, we can utilize some of these functions like dot strip and then join back and clean it up as like a single spaced, uh, good looking sentence, I would say. Uh, the next would be tokenization. This is one of the baseline most important task that we have to do because this is the way the uh, algorithms or NLP programs basically break down huge paragraphs of text into smaller chunks of words or phrases and then kinds of creates that uh, whole sentence. So you can create tokenization based on only say space. You say that, okay, this is a whole sentence and I want particular words uh, for particular, uh, like uh, that separated by a space. Sometimes for business use cases, we also want to keep phrases, right? Like say, if you think about the word uh, United States of America, even though it has space in the middle, but it has to be kept together for the meaning to be preserved. Otherwise, uh, United States uh, of America separately has can have different connotation or meaning to it. So that needs to be handled uh, case to case basis and when we are working directly with the data. Uh, the next would be spell check. This is also very important. Like I'm sure you guys have seen uh, like in um, social media and blogs, Twitter posts, when people tweet or in Reddit threads, when they talk about something, there can be a lot of spelling mistakes. And if you're working with socially scraped data, uh, utilizing or building your models with wrong spellings is like a big, I would say a big cross and that can lead to a big model failure. So uh, if you guys are interested in learning more about it, please refer to Peter Norvig's spell checker. Uh, Peter Norvig is a, a scholar uh, at Google and he created the spell checker that kind of, you know, maps the jacar distance between multiple spellings and sees that how close each word is to each other. Like if you see that this correction here is a function that I'm calling and the, this, this function is from directly referred, uh, referring to Peter Norvig's spell checker, uh, saying that uh, the word spelling, if you see the spelling is S-P-E-L-I-N-G, which is a wrong spelling, right? So uh, in the training file, they must have had different variations of the spelling. And then based on the uh, distance similarity between these two words, spelling has been the answer that they gave us is the correct one, which is double L that seemed to be the most appropriate based on all their training data sets. So this is also a very important step in the process. Uh, 
The next is contractual mapping. Like uh, I, I wouldn't go too deep into it. Uh, you guys can look for uh, what are the use cases for this, but this is just like, if you use words like won't, can't, th that kind of doesn't map out to words or tokenization very correctly. So you, we would need to, you know, kind of map it out. Like won't would be uh, will not, can't would be cannot, and etc. Uh, another next step is like lemmatization and stemming. So this is just to make sure that we have words that uh, have multiple ways of saying right. So game is like gaming, games, gamed. So these are all part of one particular word, which is game, and has been used in different formats and in different forms. So how can we reduce that number of uh, words? Because if you keep taking all these variations, then the huge uh, corpus, corpus is like a, you know, a summation of all kinds of data or all the full data set that you're utilizing to build the model is called the corpus. So that corpus would become too big and the matrix functions that we will utilize in there can tend to become too, uh, I would say, complex in calculation. So it's always a good practice, but also depends on case-to-case -case business use cases that can we reduce that down to the only the base word, which is game in all these examples that you see in the screen. Um, so next step is stop words, like I mentioned. So say when we speak, we talk with a lot of um, yes, uh, uh, uh or articles, uh, and then so, so on and so forth. So we need to reduce these words as well. So, and only keep the contextual words that serves as purpose to the sentence and gives us enough information on what the program or what the computer should do about it or the, uh, the NLP algorithm should do about it. So we need to remove these top words as well, like uh, additional words, which does not provide much context to the sentence. And then there is also case-based. Uh, uh, so here in this example, if you see, like say, if you have uh, a sentence and you want to understand what kind of, uh, you know, prep, is it a preposition, is it a verb, or if it's a, you know, conjunction, uh, so that can also be done using a part of speech tagging in NLP. And this kind of gives you a better understanding if it's a noun or if there is a name in the sentence or what, if there is a name of a country in the sentence or a person, et cetera. Or if it's a number, like you see 2.6 has been tagged as number. Uh, and dollar sign has been tagged as a symbol. So it gives us more insight about the data that we are utilizing in the, uh, in the uh, code. Great, so that was like a very quick, uh, oh, I, I knew I, I know that I rushed through some of these basic, uh, the, the baseline use cases, but then uh, I, I hope that this gives you a structure. If you want to learn more about it, you know that how to start and go about that. So let's move into transfer learning in NLP uh, and how we utilize all these baseline scenarios that we just talked about in transfer learning and utilizing in in building our models in a better way. So this is a very favorite quote uh, by Andrew Ng. Andrew Ng is like, uh, I would say, the god uh, of NLP and also of ML in the data science domain. So he says that transfer learning will be the next driver of ML success. And he said that in 2016, and now we are standing in 2020. And we have seen so much growth, exponential growth in this sector, and uh, that all the big companies are trying to leverage transfer learning and keeping the uh, baseline models similar to address multiple uh, use cases and scenarios. So we, we'll see what that is. So just to give you, uh, before I start showing complicated images here, the basic general idea, if you see the definition here, is just a machine learning technique where a model that is trained on one task, say you have one general task and a model has been trained on that task, that is like kind of repurposed for a second related task and not necessarily the same task. So it has to be similar in the same domain, but not exactly same so you you know we're kind of you know learning some of the features from the general task and utilizing that in the next one so here's an example so say you have a data set one x and y and the x is the general image and y is the classified object so like say if it's a cat or a dog uh, etc right and the example of this data set like you can look up is imagenet data set it's a huge image database and the data repository now this is a it, this might look complicated, but this is just a, a diagram of a neural network. Like say, if you have all the inputs A, B, C, which is different features of an image, like what's the curve, what's the edge, what's the color, uh, et cetera. 
and then the red and the green layers are like the hidden layers and then the blue layer which you see is like the first 1d dense layer that we have as a summation of the all average weighted uh, ca ca calculations that happened in the middle right so what would be the output the output is the y hat and for the data set a the output was is it if it's a cat or a dog etc based on all the parameters the data set one had now think about a situation where you want to categorize between uh, say an image and you want to label it if it's an image from an urban society or a rural society so you see that it still falls in the same domain as identifying image but not exactly the same uh, features right like you don't want to label it by cat or a dog but you want to label it as a one step one level higher as a urban image or a rural image so we can still do that by you know kind of utilizing the last layer the layer 4 and retraining only layer 4 to give us the uh, last step classification and changing our output format to only give us as a u or r that's urban and rural and not the other features that we got from uh, the previous data set if uh, uh, I, I know that i'm uh, explaining a little fast through here but please uh, ask any questions that you have and we can uh, you know come back to it uh, later so the, like i said the example would be uh, say of a small labeled data set urban versus rural but you can still use the features of say a tree how a tree looks how a car looks and maybe how a you know a tr truck looks so maybe using those sub features we would be able to use that features in data too and uh, label it if it's a rural or an urban image so here uh, here's like why you want to perform transfer learning here are some of the tasks that you can utilize like say for the task one for which we have massive amounts of data but it's not the same task as task two but in a similar domain so say you have you scraped voice data from audio sources like youtube for Hindi, uh, English, and other languages, and you pre-trained a network, right? So you can still use that word by, and still use that pre-trained model for a speech recognition in a completely different language, which is a which is Bengali, a, a, a regional language uh, in India. But you can utilize those features of a language learning that you have done using English and other anything, and like use the translate features and still use those cases for a different language uh, recognition. The second example is the same one that we just discussed. ImageNet has millions of tagged images of general objects of the world, like a truck, tree, ship, water, et cetera. And then you can use those for image recognition for uh, urban versus rural and uh, et cetera. Great, so when to use transfer learning? So here are some of the things that we need to keep in mind to see if the problem we have at hand and our business case, use case, does it need uh, a transfer learning and if it needs do i have a correctly pre-trained data that i can leverage for the transfer learning right these are two questions we need to first review so here is this the the first one is the scarcity of labeled data so basically it says that if uh, you say creating labeled data is expensive right so you need time expert resources in the training processes so if you feel that you have a business case scenario where this gathering of labeling data is too heavy so you can think about a process that can i leverage something else that's already in the that's outsourced or some somebody that has already solved that problem beforehand uh, so he, the next step is the exact same thing that if there is a network that exists with massive amount of data for a task but it has to be a, a similar underlying properties like you can't utilize a data that does you know a pre-trained model that does fraud analytics for a credit card and utilize that for image classification right those are two completely different uh, problems to solve but uh, the example that we discussed that would be a, a good uh, source of uh, distinguishing the next would be the next is like the the one that i mentioned that the transfer of knowledge would be applicable applicable if the learned features from task one which is our general and very broad tasks are closer to task two inputs. So for, think about it, like the image that we were talking about, uh, rural versus uh, urban. So that still has those inputs, right? Like in a rural image, you would see a grassland, you would see, uh, you know, uh, roads, big trucks, uh, et cetera, like big farmlands, similar. Uh, and those features already exist as separate entities in our general 
task one, which was just about uh, all the worldly things without tagging them if they are rural or urban, right? So this is the general overview. Like, don't get, um, you know, uh, don't think this is a complicated image. Just think about it from this perspective that a traditional machine learning problem, we have different tasks, right? Like uh, task A, task B, task C, and for each of them, we are creating a different learning system or a different learning uh, model and creating it uh, not, uh, like they do not intertwine with each other. They are completely separate. But the, what transfer learning says is like, can we use two tasks, say A and B, as the source task? We create a model and we have a lot of knowledge from that model, right? We have insights about those data. Can we utilize that and transfer those knowledge to a target task? Uh, target task here would be urban versus rural and utilize that knowledge about all about all the knowledge about dogs, cats, trees, et cetera, and apply that to our target tasks and create a separate learning system. So it's just that you're utilizing the baseline features of a previously pre-trained big corpus model with similar input features and just trying to see how you can transfer those knowledge to a different target task, uh, but from the same domain of problem uh, that you're trying to solve. So here comes Bert, like uh, <laughs> this is a favorite cartoon from Sesame Street, but it says that, hey, I'm Bert, how may I help you? So let's look at what Bert can do in, in terms of this. But before we go into Bert, I just wanted to introduce this very general concept of word embeddings. Uh, I know maybe uh, we are running a little bit uh, behind on time, but I'll just quickly wrap through it. So word, word embedding is nothing but you know a feature vector representation of multiple words. Like say, if you have a whole lot of text, a whole lot of corpus, uh, when you vectorize them or when you tokenize them, like we discussed before, this is a kind of a map that happens, uh, a relation that happens within the tokenization and the vector space in NLP. And you see that there are multiple relations, right? Like you see a king is connected to a man, closer queen is collected, connected to a, a term called woman, which is closer. And in the next image, you see that we create, you know, a cluster of similar looking words. So fish, eggs, and meat, if you see, fall under a very close tight cluster here. There's uh, things here like oil, fuel, energy, heat, electricity. So by looking at them, we know that they come from a similar backdrop of context. And that's why they are kind of represented in this vector space as a, a, a closely knitted words. And this helps, I'll just quickly go uh, forward. And this helps in ensuring that when we are mapping all these words in a vector space and in the metric space, we understand how close each word is to each other. So like say in this example, helicopter, drone, and rocket are definitely closer to each other than helicopter and goose, right? But goose is very clearly closely associated with eagle and bee. Uh, great, so this was just, a, just to show you how word embedding or the matrix of NLP works under the hood. So in BERT, this is a very, like it's called the BERT mountain by Chris McCormick. You can look up uh, his great YouTube tutorials if you want to learn more about it. But he just basically says that BERT is kind of built up on a lot of uh, innovation and technological advances that we had in NLP in the last uh, couple of years. And if, you, if you're starting now, don't think that you won't be able to learn BERT because it's too complicated. He just says that you need to focus on these top three layers, like learn about transformers, learn about how you can uti how transformers utilize attention, which is a mechanism to create the whole solutions with BERT. Now, I know that that was too heavy and uh, hectic. Now think about it from the transformers point of view, like they are here to help us. So they're, it's a heavy concepts, but if you like Optimus Prime, you know that he's not harmful. He's just heavy and big, but at the end of the day, he'll help you and help you, sorry, and help you how? Uh, like this, this is the general idea of transformers. Like you have an input file, there's a layer of coders and decoders, <coughs> sorry. And the output of the decoders would be a translated version of the input file that you gave to the model. Right, and how does this happen? It happens this way. So BERT, the full form, as it says, it's, it's a big mouthful. It's a bi-directional encoder representations from transformer. So it basically says that this is a model that has been pre-trained 
uh, on Wikipedia with uh, 2,000. 2500 million words and a book corpus of 800 million words the concept of birth why it is like you know a little path breaking to all the previous uh, nlp based models we had is that bidirectional means birth learns from information from a particular sentence from both left and right side at one point of time so it's basically capturing the content text of both the sites together rather than siloing it out in a step-by-step -step format, which the previous methods in NLP used to do. What happens in this? This makes, this is the first bi-directional unsupervised and pre-trained on plain text model that would give you contextual understanding and better representation of words that are similar, that sound similar, but makes a complete different sense in the way they have been used in a sentence. And we will see how in this example. See, this is an example. It says that we went to the river bank. And the next sentence is, I need to go to bank to make a deposit. So now the bank word is a similar, uh, is the same word, right? But it has two different meanings based on where it has been used in the context of the sentence. So when Bert learns from both left and right side together, it kind of makes it up that the river word is key in order to understand the meaning of bank in this particular sentence. And the second sentence, make a deposit, is also a particular phrase that gives the meaning to the word bank, which is left to the word bank. So now think of the very previous, the very general ones like a TFIDF or a very to simple tokenization formats that we used before in NLP that would not capture these meaning and this contextual references. And then sometimes we'll map these two banks together very closely in the vector space that we saw right now, right? Uh, in the chart in the couple of slides before. That would be a wrong annotation and a wrong um, uh, format of uh, making these two words together. So that's where uh, BERT comes in to give more contextual uh, meaning. So basically, uh, just to give you a quick understanding, BERT basically has three embedding layers. They have it has a token, it has a position, and it has a, it has a segment. Now, to, if you get some time, like maybe look up or read up some uh, detailed blogs, uh, Jay Alamar has a great blog on understanding uh, Bert. Uh, his name is Jay Alamar. Uh, if you read his blogs, it'd be very clear that how he has separated or how he has explained this. He says that okay, Bert first takes the position of the sentence, like say which the word is positioned in which uh, position in the sentence. So is it in the first word? Is it the second word, etc.? Then it talks about that which segment it is applied to. So is it the, if there's a two sentence, is the first, is the word present in the first sentence or the word is present in the second sentence? And we will see an example just in the next slide. And the token based is just the tokenization that we spoke about in the first few slides in uh, how to process the NLP. So it basically maps all these information together to create this whole uh, complicated, uh, complicated under the hood, but not for the users who are using. It just says that uh, how a word is mapped in terms of the position in where it belongs to a sentence, a position in where it belongs to uh, the cup in the multiple sentence and where the token lies. So these two trained tasks is what BERT helps us in. Like think about in this, the strength of bidirectionality is measured by this. So say the input uh, input is two sentences. The man went to the dash, it's masked, right? Like the, the, the purpose of BERT is to predict what this word would be. And then he bought a dash of milk, which is another masked word. Now, in order for Birds to completely, since it's learning from bidirectional way of multiple sentences, the masked uh, process is very important. Otherwise, in hindsight, uh, Bert would be kind of cheating and understanding, oh, uh, the man went to store is more common than the man went to, I don't know, like somewhere, like a man went to um, a space, which is true, but then it's kind of like less common in daily uh, terms of text that you would be using in your conversations. So here the labels would be store and gallon. Then, and the another task that Bert is supposed to do is to understand the model relationships between two sentences. So this is where the segment positioning comes into play. So like say if you have sentence A, 
that the man went to the store and sentence B as he bought a gallon of milk. So that makes sense. So the label would be, yeah, this is a correct next statement. But if you have another example called say sentence A, which is the man went to the store and sentence B, penguins are flightless. So these two sentences separately has very correct, uh, like they, 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 have, they are grammatically correct, but they do not belong with each other. So the label would be, no, it's not a next sentence, right? So uh, I know so this was just to under, to show you the importance of attention, which I mentioned in the uh, few slides back. I'll just quickly go back. Uh, oops, yeah, here. So transformer attention and birds together makes a killer combination of creating a very efficient modeling methodology. So I will not go too uh, deep into attention, but this is just to show you that what attention means. The attention is just to say that which words the here in this case, if you see the animal didn't cross the street because it was too late. Now, if you are a human reader, you would understand it refers to the animal, right? But how will the computer program understand that what the it signifies to? Is the it the talking about the animal? Is the it talking about the street? Is the it referring to tired? what is it so this is called attention uh, the probability matrix that the uh, computer program generates is to find that encoding word it and which it refers to so that focus on the animal is then the final solution to understanding the context of the all of the words together Great, so we can uh, look at some code very quickly. Uh, I will not go through too much of it, uh, but I'll just show you how, what we are do doing. So basically, if you have worked with Keras before, or even if you have not, uh, you can just look up on how you can download some of the pre-trained model uh, that, has, that Keras has already released and how we can leverage those models. So once you download the models, uh, you just put it up. So I am utilizing Google Colab. Uh, it's a very efficient way of doing some of the uh, prototyping and testing rather than using, using your own laptop because uh, they give you access to, sorry, GPUs and TPUs, which uh, sometimes it's hard to have in your own personal uh, hard drive. So here uh, we're just downloading some of the very uh, general packages. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking into my second screen uh, where my page is open. Uh, so sorry for looking away from the screen. Uh, and then here, what we are trying to do is this, we are loading a pre-trained model. This is the uh, load model and the config path where we have uploaded some of the models. And if you print out the model summary, you will see that how that model has been trained, how many layers it has, and it will show you the whole path of the encoder forward normal, and then how the last layer looks like in the uh, dense format file. Once we have that, now say you have this format file, which is the 20 news group, you can uh, access this and download the, it has, I guess, uh, some couple of thousands of news articles from uh, multiple uh, publication houses. And uh, uh, the idea is to generate these labels. So predict these labels utilizing the small data set you have. So that this label would be say politics, there is electronics, there is like, you know, recreational sport, baseball, et cetera. So if you have a small amount of data set of all these labels, how can you utilize a pre-trained text model to kind of uh, you know, predict some features? I'll just quickly go down and show you some example here. So now the model, the new prediction model that we used, utilizing the pre-trained model that was completely trained on a different data set, we got a 0.52 accuracy rate. Now you would say a oh, 0.52 is not great, not great, but a uh, great starting point. So that's the whole thing that we want. Like we can build on top of uh, a baseline good model that gives you a good accuracy score and then keep doing fine tuning to understand better about it. And uh, rather than like, you know, starting from scratch where you have no data, uh, nothing of that sort. And you're starting like, uh, you don't know where to, what to do or go about it. Peter, so we do have we do have yeah. a question. And yeah. Plus, you're almost out of time. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the question. Yeah, is, I think we can wrap it up and then uh, answer any questions. Uh, well, here, here the, right now. the question, and I think it actually fits in with what you were just talking about, is what are typical implementations of NLP? Typical implementation. Okay. Typical sure. implementations, so, right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, 
So in the first few uh, slides, I guess we discussed that we can do a lot with NLP like machine translations. I know that uh, in some of the projects that I have worked hands on, we want to understand user segmentations and what uh, all our customer profiles are working or thinking or talking about, right? So like if I am uh, reading a lot about politics and I say I stay in New York and I go to uh, school, so what kind of persona customer profile can I B and what kind of products do, would I want to like? That's like one general idea of customer uh, user segmentation. The second would be, say you want to understand uh, sentiment analysis, you want to do, uh, you know, if right. you have a lot of text data, say Amazon reviews, how do you think that Amazon understands or analyzes the bunch of reviews that users give for yeah. multiple products that they have? So that's like very two general use cases that uh, yeah. applications can have. Okay. Is there, is um, there, you have okay. about you have about two minutes now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I guess I am almost. This will uh, be a quick uh, run through on code. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, end with this note that uh, we understand that we are utilizing transfer learning in all of these use cases, but why do you think it's important? So it has multifaceted importance because training a single AI model can emit as much carbon as five cars in their lifetime. And I'm not kidding. This is a uh, article by MIT Technology Review. You can go and review uh, these data. So that's why it's very important that all of us who has the capacity to utilize the big structured model that Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA is releasing and how we can utilize that rather than like, you know, in reinventing the wheel. So that's the whole concept that we want to make our models better. We want to achieve that accuracy, but can we do that you know, uh, environment friendly way, like not putting that much pressure in our data systems and uh, in our environment. So yeah, I guess the closing remarks are like NLP is hard because human intelligence do, do, does set a higher benchmark and we need to achieve that accuracy by understanding and leveraging more and more data. Bad data cleaning makes it harder. So uh, uh, make sure that you do all the base steps very clearly. Uh, NLP is not magic. There is a lot of logic to it. And always the advanced neural networks are not good solutions. Uh, you need to see what your business use case is and see what kind of problem you want to solve rather than start with, oh, I want to use neural networks. That's not the answer to it. So these are some of the additional resources and uh, you can leverage. And yeah, I guess uh, thank you to the whole team for organizing this huge uh, event. I had a blast talking to you all. If you, <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions do let me know and you can reach out. You can also reach out and uh, check out our Indellian's work portfolio and uh, we can connect later as well. Great, I think I just wrapped it up in the edge of the moment. Uh, sorry for taking uh, a few extra couple of minutes, uh, Meridi. Uh, how do you want to go about from here if you have any yeah, further questions? Just, well, we do have our second presentation here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. but that was really interesting. Actually, I, I, I suspect you could have talked for at least oh. another hour. And I, yeah. And yeah. It's I a never ending. It's I'm a not gonna have time to ask. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> but um, the whole of Data Summit Connect is being recorded and mm -hmm. it will be up on the DBTA YouTube channel next week. So for attendees, you'll be getting a notice about that. So that will give you an opportunity to learn more and perhaps email questions to Jada. Um, and now, for our second presentation in this session. Uh, this is from Ben Sharma, co-founder and chief product officer of Zaloni. This is a pre-recorded presentation on how to streamline and secure your data supply chain. So Steve, you wanna run that? All right. Hi everyone. And thanks for uh, being here today. So what I'll talk about today is a couple of different patterns that we're seeing and how do you, from an architecture standpoint, think about uh, putting together an, a set of data management functions that cover the entire data supply chain. Today, what we see is uh, in organizations of all shapes and sizes, there is uh, quite a bit of inefficiencies going on. So that 
serves up in different formats. So we see complexity in terms of data um, that they have to deal with, uh, whether it's the volume of data or types of different data sets, whether it is from on-prem or cloud SaaS type of uh, data providers. Um, and these environments are being stood up in various different environments as well. There are all these legacy platforms that are on-prem then there are new platforms being stood up in cloud data lakes and cloud data warehouse environments. At the same time, there is not much in terms of automation and reusability of these uh, data engineering pipelines. So these are being built in a very, very custom ad hoc way so that whenever there's a new data source that needs to be provided for on-stream use cases, then you have to go through the same process all over again. The other big challenge that we see is that there is quite a bit of um, kind of, I would say, lack of governance in terms of either it is very kind of traditional governance model or there is no governance. Um, so oftentimes that becomes a challenge because uh, especially in regulated verticals or where you need to have proper security and controls around your data, um, without the governance, a lot of these initiatives don't go very far. So how do you think about this from a, from a data ops standpoint so that uh, you're streamlining that as part of your process? And then last but not least, it is all about providing quick access to the data uh, to your data consumers in a self-service manner. So that is often a challenge because a lot of times these become IT projects where as the data needs to be provided, there needs to be a IT team that needs to be stood up that actually builds these data engineering pipelines and makes the data available. So those are some of the common patterns that we see in terms of um, what enterprises have to deal with in a complex data environment. So before I get into the specifics of how Arena platform from Zaloni solves these, solves these issues, let me talk a little bit about the modern data architecture and what are some of the components in terms of your supply chain of data all the way from your source systems as you need to provide this data to your target systems, whether these are applications or um, ML use cases that you're building or BI and reporting um, tools that you want to serve this data out of. So what we see is that, um, there are, uh, first of all, a set of deployment layers that you need to think about, whether it is um, you're deploying on-prem, you're managing your platforms, uh, data platforms that are on-prem, or they're in cloud. So they could be uh, object stores in cloud, like S3 and ADLS, or they could be more of um, a cloud data warehouse, like Snowflake, or um, an object store, uh, I mean, a document object store like MongoDB and others. Um, so you need to think about your um, storage and compute layer um, that you're deploying these platforms to manage, but then you need to think about your data management functions. How do you ingest data from various sources? How do you manage the metadata? And this is the technical business and operational metadata. How do you uh, do various tasks in terms of data integration, in terms of um, standardization and merging and correlating data sets and making it available for downstream use cases. Then you need to think about your governance and data quality aspects in terms of who has access to what data, role-based access control, masking and tokenization of sensitive attributes, and so on and so forth. And while you do all of these different data management functions, make sure you are capturing lineage so that you can um, comply and uh, make sure your risk teams are comfortable in terms of how you're making this data available to whom you're making it available. And there is auditability and traceability of, of various steps. And then you need to think about how do you enable some of the self-service functions in terms of data prep because not your, not always your data engineering team or the IT team will be aware of the format and the structure and the meaning of the data. So how do you enable data prep in a self-service manner? And then also being able to provide a catalog or a marketplace of these data sets so that people can, first of all, come and find data and then they can use that data for various downstream use cases. So that's how we think about kind of the 
set of data management functions that are required as part of this data supply chain. So as um, Arena, um, uh, as the go-to-market for Arena, as we position ourselves and then enable our customers to be able to modernize their data platforms, we think about um, the core functionality um, of these data management functions in terms of these three Cs. The first is catalog. So how do you inventory data wherever it exists? And we are seeing that it exists in an in increasingly decentralized manner in um, various different data stores. So being able to inventory the data, being able to capture active metadata, being able to then classify and profile that data are some of the core functions in terms of our catalog function. Then we think about our control pillar, which is essentially all about data governance. So how do you make sure that you can trust this data with proper data quality checks where you can separate out the good data from the bad data? You need to think about masking and tokenization of sensitive attributes. You need to think about rule-based access control, capturing lineage along each step of the way. And then last but not least, um, you need to think about the data consumption aspect of it. So how, who are your data consumers? How are they going to uh, be enabled out of this platform in a self-service manner so that they can come and shop for data in a data marketplace, they can uh, enrich those data sets, collaborate around them with annotations and tagging and providing various aspects, uh, uh, creating new enriched data sets uh, if needed. And then being able to also um, vision it into a sandbox uh, so that they can do ad hoc exploratory analytics without any IT team being involved. So that's kind of the core of our platform in terms of catalog control and consume. One other aspect I wanted to touch on is a um, lot of times the data um, storage layer needs to be partitioned in a way so that um, proper security controls can be provided in a policy-based approach. So we think about this end zone governance. So we, we call this the end zone governance. We think about this as a zone-based architecture where data can come in and land in a given zone. And for an example, I'm calling this the raw zone. Um, but then you may want to apply some uh, processing on that data in terms of masking and tokenization of sensitive attributes and doing data quality checks and so on and so forth. And then you may want to publish that uh, kind of validated data set into a trusted zone so that now your um, end users can come in and access the data from the trusted zone so that it is certified and it, um, it has gone through these checks and balances. Then we also see in this zone-based architecture that there's need for lines of businesses being able to create their own data sets uh, for their specific use cases, in addition to the data sets that were brought in from the source systems. So we see a need for something like a refined zone or a use case specific zone where you can populate and create these new data sets and then also publish them for broader consumption. And then last but not least, we see a need for the experimentation area, if you will, where you're able to provision sandboxes, where you're able to do a, your use case quickly in a uh, self-service manner. So this zone-based governance is something that we see being commonly used that enables agility and self-service with the proper governance controls in place. Um, and then these can be defined based on security policies or governance policies that you're put in, putting in place. And they can be tied to certain roles in this case we're showing you in an example, like how, uh, who has access to which zones, for example, data scientists and data analysts have access to the trusted zone, but um, data scientists also have access to the raw zone because they may want to uh, be able to use the raw data in its original format. So this is an essential part of kind of the data ops uh, streamlining and the security aspects of how you want to create your end-to-end -end, uh, pipelines uh, from source to target. So just to summarize, um, you need to think about how you can streamline your data ops processes for your analytic success. And to do that, uh, one of the key aspects is you need to think about a unified approach where you're not um, having silo of data management functions. You're doing this in a continuum, if you will, 
um, so that all the way from ingestion to consumption of data is done in a with a common metadata layer with a common security layer so that you can reduce that amount of friction if you will you're doing this efficiently so you need to think about automation and reusable pipelines that you're building um, so that you don't when a new data set needs to be onboarded you don't have to create yet another <clears throat> uh, pipeline you can reuse the existing pipelines based on some state information and things like that and you need to be able to do this from a standardized way from a governance perspective so that it's the right size governance it's not just one size fits all type of model but you have to actually standardize these data pipelines so that certain data sets may be tightly controlled whereas other data sets may be lightly controlled and so that's kind of one of the key requirements we see from an agility standpoint and then last but not least you need to keep the end user in mind so the data consumers whether they're the data science teams data analysts or even business users may want to come and find data sets and use it in a self-service manner with with the proper trust with the proper governance in place uh, without having an IT team being involved so that's an important aspect of uh, the data ops uh, streamlining and security aspects you need to think about well thank you for for that um and thank you all for coming to Data Summit Connect. Complete recordings available. They will all be available uh, on the DBTA YouTube channel. So many thanks to Jaida and to Ben for their presentations in this final session of Data Summit Connect. And it was a really good three days. So thanks to everybody and we'll see you in YouTube.